Hi guys and welcome to Manch Talk. I'm Carla Garrick and this is my guest Rachel Goldsmith. So as you guys can see uh, Miss Tammy is not here today. She is uh, having a lot of fun in Florida. So uh, that's a fun place to be right now. It is and you know and it's kind of cold and windy today so I kind of wish I was in Florida too. It's like that last breath cold snap you know that you know means it's actually the end of winter yes and i i applaud you because you're all like girl i'm wearing my mom's for liberty t-shirt i put my winter <laughs> gear away already i'm not breaking it back oh you out. did yes absolutely <laughs> I did not, but that means I'm behind with stuff. So uh, <laughs> welcome back to this edition of Manch Talk. I am delighted to welcome my guest back. For those of you who have been watching the show for some time, as well as my show, The Carla Garrick Show, which drops on Wednesdays, uh, some of you may know my auspicious guest. Uh, Rachel is one of my favorite humans in the whole wide world. And, um, and I've really been excited and delighted to sort of see how I almost see it as the second wave of activists who kind of came to New Hampshire. Uh, if you were under a rock and you don't know, we are free staters. We're really cool, awesome people. You guys should join our club or our <laughs> tribe. Um, but basically, we're, we're people who are moving to New Hampshire for the quality of life we find here. For the, uh, It's a great place to raise families, all of that. I moved in 2008, and you came out in 2016. 16. 15. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, I've been trying to rope Rachel into projects and did rope her into many projects. <laughs> she then went off and had three kids. <laughs> but, um, but you are stepping sort of back into the super great activist role. So let's start just for folks who haven't been following. Tell us what is Moms for Liberty and kind of why you started it. And then we'll go from there. Moms for Liberty is a, a nonprofit advocacy group that fights for the rights of families and students um, to, uh, they fight against indoctrination in the government school systems. So they fight to bring um, transparency and accountability to school boards. Um, they fight to uh, allow students to have a voice when it comes to their own medical decisions. And um, I think most importantly and most uh, challenging is this fight against teachers' unions. Um, teachers' unions are, an or are lobbying groups that really do not have students um, in their, as their, in their best interest. Uh, and they really, they don't speak for a lot of teachers either. And so a lot of teachers feel sort of shanghaied into um, paying their dues and then being forced to uh, go along with curriculum that they feel uncomfortable with. And as a result of teachers unions um, contracts with school boards and school systems, um, I think everybody loses. Right. And so it's so interesting to me, you just mentioned the unions, you know, because one of the criticisms I often hear, and I think it's because not so much the framing we do. So the criticism is, oh, we hate education, like people who are pro liberty or people who are trying to reform the schools or any of that. Some are like, yeah, we want everyone to be dumb. And if you're poor, we want you to be extra dumb. <laughs> so let's just clarify. That is not what we are about. We Absolutely in fact not. feel like the schools are failing students. So we're all paying into this system and we're not getting out what we were promised. I was watching a documentary the other day. It was called American Factory. And it was a it was one of the weirdest movies I've watched in a while because I guess it was um it, it won some awards and then the Obamas actually picked up on it and pushed it. But in, in a nutshell, the, the premise of the movie is a Chinese billionaire who comes to America to, I think it was in Ohio, and opens a factory called the Fuyo, Fuyoa Glass Factory America. So it's a Chinese investor who came to America to start a factory here because it was in, oh, it was in Dayto uh, Daytona, Ohio, I don't know. Anyway, so my point was there's this factory and then they decide to unionize. Mm. And so the story is really a little bit about the union. Now, I personally support right to work. I think that people should join a union if they want. 
but they shouldn't be forced to join a union. Absolutely. Now, the problem, of course, with the teachers unions, and there is a point to this, Rachel's like, make it work, girl. <laughs> Bring it back <laughs> around. <laughs> in, in the movie, so when people wanted to unionize, so the story actually kind of goes about, are they going to unionize or aren't they? There was this lady on the shop floor and she's just, she drives her forklift and she's just doing her stuff. And she, uh, they have her on a clip where she goes, well, I don't want to join a union because all the union does is it protects the non-hard workers. And mm. all of us out here hustling get, um, don't, don't get the benefits because it's people who want to excel seem to not necessarily like unions as much as people who like to coast. And I will remind everyone in the wise words of Larry Sharp, you can only coast downhill. Mm, that's a good point. It's a good point, right? Yeah. I mean, speaking of coasting downhill, since the teachers unions forced all schools in New Hampshire to adopt Common Core, every metric that they specifically came up with, I mean, this isn't something that the New Hampshire DOE came up with, but these metrics are from Common Core, are from teachers unions. Every single metric has been declining. Students' literacy in reading, students' literacy in math, in New across the board in New Hampshire has been in decline in the last 10 years. And there are a lot of reasons for this to come about, and we can have a discussion in more detail about why that might be. But the solution is not more of the same. Right. The solution is competition. And we in New Hampshire have an amazing school choice program, and I think that allows for competition um, for students and for families to find ways that learning works for them. And it means that not only do wealthy students have the opportunity and wealthy families have an opportunity to find private schools, but it means that people who are lower income also have that opportunity. And that's the kind of thing that the free market provides. That's not a centralized solution. That's a libertarian solution. Absolutely. And, and one of the things that really fascinates me that seems to surprise people uh, when, you act, when you drill down in it is if you look at the cost that we're spending per student in New Hampshire and you go head to head between a public school and a private school, the private schools are cheaper mm -hmm. for the most part than the public schools. In fact, there was that situation just recently in Croydon where they cut their school budget in half, in half. which you know, half the town is upset about the people who are getting tax relief who don't have kids are actually quite happy about it. <laughs> but but the, the rationale for that, or at least the argument I heard coming from the people who made the proposal um, was, well, the Montessori school costs $9,000. So we will give the, the public school students $10,000. So actually, you know, a thousand bucks more, 10% more, and let's see if we can do it for that amount. And people are like, no. And I'm like, but if the Montessori school can do it, if private schools can do it, then surely we can figure out for the public schools to do it at a at a, a reasonable cost as well. So the argument then becomes, are the costs that make it more expensive, is that built into the administration, into the unions, into the fees? That's sort of where it comes from. Yeah, right? it's absolutely a result of administrative bloat. I mean, New Hampshire is already spending, I think it's something like $19,000 on average per public school student, and that's 5,000 above the national average. So if you're saying that uh, they're spending in Croydon $10,000 per student, I mean, it's much lower than the national average, but I, I don't see how the numbers, I mean, $10,000 for a student, is it feels like a lot. You know what I mean? Like, what are they, what are we actually paying for? And if you look into these teacher contracts, and many of them are publicly available, the, the teachers' unions' contracts are publicly available online. All you have to do is a little bit of digging. Um, you can find that they are spending, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on salaries for union employees, like the specific teachers' union employees, not on um, advocacy, not on finding ways to improve student outcomes. You know, if they were looking at uh, research to figure out, are these curriculum actually improving student outcomes? The answer would be, in a lot of cases, no. As we can see by the metrics that they've asked us to be performing, right. the test scores are down. Um, and so, yeah, it does seem to be sort of the thing that 
you know, where is this money going? going. It's going into the pockets of people who are do not have kids' interests at heart. Right. And, and frankly, as you said, according to their own metrics, they're not meeting their benchmarks. So something should change. So you've been involved with Moms for Liberty now about a year. Is that right? Something like that. Um, I initially found Moms for Liberty, the national organization, maybe a year ago. Okay. Not quite. And then um, I thought, you know, how dare they come up with this incredible organization? <laughs> anywhere, what didn't I think of that? Anywhere outside of the freest state in the country. Um, so, of course, I immediately, uh, you know, asked to found a chapter here. And we went through the process of getting our, our charter here in Hillsborough County. Um, they do it, like, by county. And so now in New Hampshire, we have a Hillsborough County chapter and a Rockingham uh, county chapter and in a few months I'll be out west doing some informational sessions to see if there's anybody interested yeah. in taking on um, the mantle in the rest of New Hampshire. So uh, for folks watching online if you're not watching this on a cable access here in Manchester but uh, you know reach out to Rachel if if that's something you're interested in you know probably looking for a pa you know passionate moms. <laughs> moms is right there in the title. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't um, have to be moms. Okay. Uh, there are dads, uh, there are grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins. I mean we all have a vested interest in government schools schools doing better right because you know even if your kids are not in public school um, their peers are and the people that they'll be working with in the future and the people that they'll be mating with in the future you know <laughs> what I mean um, are all going to be products of this it's the largest learning environment in the country and so we all I think have a vested interest in it even people who are just taxpayers you know right. that's twenty thousand dollars of your money going to a student and they're not even learning to read properly like so can we talk about that I mean it's a bit of a segue a bit it's me so <laughs> <laughs> what else do we expect I was reading on social media last week that people were saying that part of the reason there's this failure with literacy which of course is a big deal because if you can't read you can't think critically because you can't go explore answers or find the solutions to things for yourself. If you are either illiterate or, or barely literate, it becomes very easy to control you or to plant seeds or to be like, here's the solution, just do what I say, which of course is what we saw throughout the past mm. two years of COVID mania. Absolutely. Um, so. I heard something about it has something to do with f phonetics versus like, like, what's the story there? Do you know? Yeah. So um, there are two different mechanisms that uh, literacy proponents have used to um, teach reading to kids. And one of them is phonics. And that's really the science backed version um, where, you know, you see a letter or a combination of letters and you associate the sound with those letters as opposed to sight reading, okay. which is sort of a C-spot run um, process. You know, you see the picture, you show the kid the picture first, and then you show them the word. And you would say, you know, what is that? Show them a picture of a dog and then the, the word D-O-G underneath it. Okay. Um, and you say, okay, what does it start with? D. And then you kind of like, they already know in their heads what the word is, and then they try to piece together what the sounds are. Okay. So it's... Um, instead of encouraging them to sound the words out okay. and then figure out what the word is, it's telling them to guess the word first and then fit in the letters afterwards. Okay. And so the problem <laughs> is that with simple words, it doesn't really seem like it makes a big difference. Okay. But let's say that you have a multisyllabic word or you have something that is a brand new word that has lots of weird combinations um, of letters in it. A person who... Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Absolutely. Great example. A person... And if you're reading that, a person who has never seen that word before gets very overwhelmed. <laughs> yes. It's scary to right. read... To see a word that you don't know how to yeah. read, right? It's very... when you And especially, like, you know, that's a silly fun one. Right. But, like, let's say, for example, that you're trying to learn more about um, a study 
on some type of science that you are not comfortable with. Yeah. And there are big sciencey words in there. Um, if you don't know how to break those words apart by uh, their answer, their uh, pro their base. Yeah, the, the different pieces of yeah. the word, um, the beginning of the word like anti or pro, yeah. the end of the word like ism or ology. If you don't know how to break those words down, if it's not the first thing that your mind does, um, it's very overwhelming and a lot of people just give up. Um, and so science of literacy is backed by 40 years worth of research. Well, you might argue, Millennia, when did we start with caveman drawings, hieroglyphics? Since then, we have been trying to write words on paper so that we can all agree on the things we need to agree upon. Right. But, you know, now we live in a world where apparently we are going to appoint a Supreme Court justice who is unwilling to define the word woman. So No, she said you know. biologists can define it, which I agree with. It is a, po a biological term. <laughs> right, but I mean, uh, you know, I'm also of the sense where I'm like, if we can't agree all on agree on like stuff. some basic stuff, yeah. we are in a in for a world of hurt, which of course we see we are. Yeah. So, um, so was that a political decision or so? So uh, am that's I correct? A teacher's, and, that's a teachers' union decision. And I'm correct in understanding that we picked the wrong one. We did. One. We picked okay. the sight reading. Um, it, the the main difference is that it gives kids a boost early. So uh, it allows children, very, young children, to start understanding what is in a book. Um, you know, if you're defining a book as anything that is like hardcover with pages, right? Or like, soft cover. Or soft cover, sure. But I mean, like a picture book sure. or a graphic novel or, um, and I, I think that that's a fine definition. But the uh, you see a major drop off in the ability to read around age seven or eight. Okay. Um, when they start using sight reading. Mm. It, they slow down very quickly. And right around the age eight is when children stop learning to read and start reading to learn. Oh, wow. And so when you're around age eight, you're introduced to new words, you're introduced to new concepts through literature. And if you have a uh, sight reading mentality, then it's much more challenging okay. to take on new information while you're reading. Okay, so we have a literacy issue. This is something that Moms for Liberty clearly is sort of interested in, right? So I love reading, so it was a really easy fit for me. I saw this problem and I thought, how can that? How can we politicize this? You know, and it doesn't. It's the kind of. It's the kind of. <laughs> oh, thing that, you will be so. It's incredible <laughs> how how knee jerky people are. Right. You know, I I absolutely uh, think that everyone should be able to read. Um, and in fact, uh, we are working with a number of authors from all over the country to get more books in schools that are freedom oriented. Nice. Um, but so I saw this this problem of numbers in schools of, of lower uh, test scores in schools. And I thought, well, that's a really non divisive subject that we can push for. Um, but it's incredible how knee jerky people are, people who have problems with the other things that Moms for Liberty does and therefore, you know, are taking the other side of this, are on the sight reading side, despite the like overwhelming Clear scientific evidence. evidence that they are incorrect. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It's so, really heartbreaking, actually. So, so I know. And honestly, that is something uh, that I find genuinely frustrating. We were talking about this, I forget where, maybe over the weekend the knee-jerk reaction where people are going, oh, these people are doing this, therefore we will not support it. And it's like, but wait a second, like, remember when 15 years ago we all agreed the war on drugs and how can we fix these problems and whatnot? And, and I think part of the frustration, although people don't want to admit this, is that libertarians have been the vanguard on most of the issues and had people listened to us, I don't know, in 71 when we went off the gold standard, I don't know, 2013 when, you know, like just over the years, but certainly, you know, we've been, we've been saying there are these challenges and now we're at a stage where things are actually literally collapsing mm. because of the failure of the systems we put in place. So tell me a little bit about the curricula or putting books or you, you mentioned putting. Yeah. So in a lot of parts of the country, Moms for Liberty chapters are um, working to remove 
pornographic books, essentially, from elementary schools. And um, that You know that we even gross. have to say that it's, is kind of a problem. It's really, Why is really it that gross. This, I mean, sometimes I'm like, okay, am I just looking at Twitter and I'm kind of getting one wing's propaganda, right? So you go, oh, are they sexualizing everything in the schools? And then you kind of look at some of the curricula and you're like, why are we teaching that to six-year-olds? Well, I think what happens is people get elected to the school board and they are brand new to that um, environment. And then the teachers union says, okay, well, here are all the books that we recommend. And so, of course, the person who's just been elected to the school board says, oh, well, you're a subject matter expert on this. I'm going to, you know, check on all of these. Or I'm going to, you know, um, sign off on all of these, rather. And so things kind of get put into school libraries that are really inappropriate. And the thing is that, you know, I'm for the distribution of all kinds of material. I, I think free speech is critical to the development of, you know, actual conversation and improved um, outcomes for society. Um, Freedom is good. Right. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> but there, you know, there's obviously a line and some people's line is, you know, um, on Playboy. I wouldn't want Playboy in my kids' elementary school. And some people's line Not is, even for the articles. <laughs> <laughs> um, but some, I, I don't know. The, some of the books are, are graphic novels depicting children's and adults' experiences with um, LGBT stuff. And uh, some of it is grosser, creepier, whatever word, than others. But a lot of chapters around the country are getting com some slack um, for removing books from public schools. And so, and so, of course, that becomes the headline, right. you know, book banning, book burning, that kind of stuff. But clearly, I don't think that's the motivation. Someone's not saying this book shouldn't exist. Someone is saying this book is not appropriate in a government-run school for six- or eight-year-olds or whatever the issue is. So I think, you know, we have to parse through the messaging or the propaganda from both sides. You know, things get murky and vitriolic very quickly and yeah. a lot of times I just feel like we're actually the the adults in the middle just kind of going wait a second like it isn't this or this it's like maybe it's just not this for this age group right yeah and I can respect the challenge when people say okay well you want books out what books do you want in and so I had to think about that what books do I think are appropriate um for elementary schools, and one of the authors that come, came to mind was Connor Boyack. Yeah. Um, he writes the Tuttle Twins series, uh, and he also actually just came out with an American history textbook that uh, looks really, really good. It's for the younger kids. Nice. Um, and so we'll be working with organizations like Tuttle Twins um, to encourage schools in New Hampshire to add these things to their libraries. Okay. Now, you had mentioned there's a Senate bill coming up, or we just went through crossover, so that means the House and the Senate have looked at their bills, and now they're sending them to each other. So all the good House bills go to the Senate where they mess them up, so vote for better senators. <laughs> um, but um, so what's that bill about? So actually, this is uh, House Bill 1131. Um, it prohibits mask mandates in okay. schools. So. Masks will still be optional. Uh, if people and families and students feel more comfortable wearing masks, they will be allowed to wear a mask. Um, but it prohibits all schools in New Hampshire from instituting a mask mandate. And that's tomorrow at the State House at 10 a.m. Um, so we'll be there. Uh, no matter how cold it is, I'll bust out my winter <laughs> jacket for it. <laughs> um, and I, I think it's really important that we, I went to the uh, House hearing and I spoke there. How was the turnout? It was huge. I mean, th it, we had, I they think had that's to... that's really important for folks to understand is this is unifying a lot of people because, again, you can do what you want. Just stop making other people do what you want. Right. You get to do you, but you have to let other people do them. Right. Um, no, it was incredible. They had to move from a smaller room to a larger nice. room, and there was spillover into a second room yeah. that I used very happily <laughs> to let my kids run around in. Um, and I didn't see a single person not on the committee wearing a mask. So that was really 
really nice to see. Yeah. yeah, and I I expect that we'll have a, a good turnout tomorrow as well. And uh, I mean, not to predict what's going to happen, but you're feeling cautiously optimistic. You know, I really don't know very much about the Senate. I mean, the, it is committee. in a Republican uh, majority, so I would think that if it th falls out along party lines, it should come out of the Senate. Um, sometimes they just amend things <laughs> in really strange ways that yeah. one has to look at. Um, and I, from a, like, Moms for Liberty perspective, I'm all for it. From a ANCAP or maybe, like, purist libertarian perspective, then, you know, if a private school wants to mandate masks, then I think they probably should be allowed to, and then I should be able to pull my kids from that school if you know if my kids were already there um, so I don't think the bill is perfect but I am strongly in favor of getting masks off kids um, so however we can make that happen let's do it that's fantastic so we're gonna run out of time maybe in the next four minutes or so and I want to make sure that I don't forget to ask all the things I should ask <laughs> so uh, what else should folks back know know about Moms for Liberty where can they find out more like all that good stuff um, there was something else you had mentioned before the show but I'm blanking I feel like there was one more thing you wanted to momsforliberty.org is the website and you can find our chapter um, if you are someone who's in a county that uh, isn't yellow so they have this really cool interactive map um, click find your chat find your county and you'll find the contact information for your chapter if it's not yellow then you can start a chapter um, I am going to be hosting an informational session in a few months to talk about the process of uh, building a new chapter and some best practices for freedom in education activism um, you There's can a also conference coming up too, yeah right? yeah you can also find us on Twitter uh, M for Moms for Liberty Hillsborough County or um, Moms for Liberty New Hampshire you can find us on Facebook Moms for Liberty Hillsborough County and then yeah we're gonna be hosting a freedom in education conference in mid-august which we um, will be using to give freedom-oriented families tools to better communicate and advocate for their kids in public schools. Oh, wow, I love that. Yeah, I think Frank will be coming to speak, but we have not confirmed the dates with him And yet. honestly, he, you know, Frank Edelblue, who's the current commissioner, education commissioner in New Hampshire, who's done a phenomenal job just really trying to to meet the, everyone's interests, right? Trying to actually find solutions. I think we're so caught up in this either binary, polarized, meh, eh, situation. And it's like, it's, it's not useful to anything. I mean, we all have to agree based just on the test scores. Reform is necessary. And I've said it on this show so many times, but I'm like, look, we can only say we want to reform it so many times before it's like, don't make me burn it to the ground, <laughs> which I won't do because everyone knows I'm a super peaceful person. But it's like, come on, guys, we have to start to fix these problems. And it does not happen by people just saying, no, I'm not going to. Right. right. Yeah. More of the same is not working. We have to do something different. And we can have a discussion about what that looks like specifically. And I'm happy to have that discussion because it means that we're moving in the right direction. Right. Right. So, so, you know, we implore people, regardless of what side you're on, check out Moms for Liberty, uh, follow the, the social media. Of course, follow me, check out my book, read it. You will find out I am not a crazy person <laughs> <laughs> or I'm the right kind of crazy. Um, <laughs> um, anything else you want folks back home to know before we log out for today? Thanks, everybody, for watching and tune in next week. There we go. Thanks, guys. Take care. <laughs>